Welcome back to our study on Hebrews. You are joining us because you are investing into this book of the Bible that you're studying, and and this is a time for us to dig deeper into the text, to to study it, and, and to, like I've been saying throughout these videos, have the Old Testament in one hand and the New Testament witness of the book of Hebrews in the other hand. And There's a lot to glean from the book of Hebrews, but if we want to do it well and properly, we we really need to dig down into it. We need to excavate and pull out from the text, from the context of the readers, in order to best understand the theology and the intent of the author of this book. And so that's what we've been doing. And last week we talked about Melchizedek and the priestly order that is established in him that Jesus follows in as a high priest and what it means for him to step outside of the Levitical high priest system and into the order of Melchizedek. We're moving from that, and, and if you remember from way back a few weeks ago, we talked about how the book of Hebrews is a chiasm, and what that means is you have uh, inclusios, in which A and A, the beginning and the end of the book, have similarities, B and B, the, the next section and the section after this have, conclu- have similarities, they're inclusios, and then see the main section of the text, because remember, this is the thesis of the book. The main section of the text is identifying the order of Melchizedek versus the Levitical priesthood in the Old Covenant way versus the New Covenant. And so that's what we're covering today, chapter 8, verse 1 through 10, 18. This is the section where, out of the Melchizedekian order, of the high priest so that Jesus is now established and, and Jesus is now integrated. There's also a new covenant that comes along with that. And, and the author explains that through the use of an explanation of the old covenant. And he starts out here in chapter 8, he says, Now the main point of what is being said is this, we have this kind of high priest. So he's talking about the, the Melchizedek order. We have this kind of high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle. So keep this in mind, the true tabernacle, we'll allude to that here in a second, that was set up by the Lord and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifice. Therefore, it was necessary for this priest, meaning Jesus, to also have something to offer. So, a lot to unpack there in those three verses. First of all, he's he's affirming that we have the type of high priest that isn't just an intermediary that is only human, but he is human and can bear and relate to us. But he's also God because he sits down at the right hand of the throne, which in ancient cultures, the firstborn son was the same authority as the father. And so if Jesus is identifying all throughout the gospels that he is sent by the will of the Father, that he is the Son, that he is the Son of Man. He's identifying that he has the same authority as the Father. And so he is a high priest that is fully human, but he's also fully God, and he sits down at the right hand of the throne of God. And he's a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle. Now, what does that mean? Well, the temple, as we know it in in the New Testament, and as we might have known it in the Old Testament, was a reflection of what was set up in the book of Exodus under Moses, the tabernacle, this portable dwelling place of God. And and this portable dwelling place of God, just to have a little bit of um, a picture of what that looks like, in this uh, dwelling place you had, you had, it was portable, um, you had these, the tent where this is, what the temple is modeled off of, the inside of it, and you have the the outside of the temple, the curtain that went around the courtyard. You have the courtyard where the the uh, altar is and the the area where the priest cleanses himself, the the basin, the bronze basin, and then of course you have the tabernacle itself. That was the model for the temple in Solomon, but it was established and the directions for the tabernacle was given to Moses 
very specifically. There was a lot of key features of the tabernacle that Moses could not ignore, specifically the furnishings of the tabernacle. So here we have a picture of what some of those furnishings are. You have the Ark of the Covenant. You have the lampstand, the table, and the bread of presence. You have the altar of incense, and then the bronze basin and the altar that sat outside of the temple. Those are all specific furnishings that God set forth for Abraham to, or for, for Moses to ensure was a part of the tabernacle. They were things that were necessary to be a part of the tabernacle. And you might think, well, why is that important? What, why do these things have to be a part of the tabernacle? And, and the reason is, is because the tabernacle as it stands, it's a reflection of, it's a reflection of the eternal sanctuary, the eternal dwelling place of God. The, the word for tabernacle just means house. It just means tent, dwelling. And what the author of Hebrews is establishing here is the temple, the tabernacle, those things on earth that the Israelites built and designed according to what God has, had given them. Those were reflections of the true tabernacle. And, and this is alluded to further on in verses 4 through 6. He says, now, if he was here on earth, he wouldn't be a priest since there are those offering the gifts prescribed by the law. So what he's saying is, if Jesus were still on earth, he wouldn't be considered a Levitic Levitical priest because they're offering things ascribed to the old covenant. But these things... So by the law, that's the old covenant. These things serve as a copy and shadow. So all those furnishings of the tabernacle that we just looked at, the the um, the the lampstand, the the altar, the the ark of the covenant, the the table of the bread of presence, altar of incense, all those things are shadows. They're representations of the true tabernacle, the true dwelling place of God. There's a lot of meaning behind those objects, but those objects in and of themselves are not special. They're shadows. More than that, the whole system, the whole law as itself, it's a shadow of what Jesus is establishing, which is why um, it's the, the teacher consider, continues on, therefore, you know, remember, therefore, what's it there for? Well, what the Hebrew author is te telling us is that every high priest offers something. He's appointed to offer sacrifices. Therefore, if we call Jesus, if we consider him a high priest of a different order, a high priest of a new covenant, it's necessary that this priest would have to offer something as well. And so the, the teacher, he's, he's alluding to something here. He's, he's, he's alluding to something that he's about to establish, but he's saying that what Jesus is offering is the true offering. The true offering that the old covenant and the, the temple and the original tabernacle points to. So the old covenant, the old covenantal system and, and temple were a picture that points to Jesus and God's dwelling. They point to the dwelling place of God. They're an image. They're a shadow. They're not the full picture. Now, this was something hard to grasp for an Israelite. You've grown your entire life being told that the temple is the dwelling place of God. And it was. But when Jesus comes... And, and this is really important in the gospel witness, is that we learned that the temple curtain was ripped in two. Now, what the temple curtain was, it was what separated the most holy place, the place where God's throne room in the temple was, from the holy place. And when it rips in two, that's signifying that God's dwelling is no longer in the temple, it's in the earth. And in and, and the book of Psalms, we get... Uh, many, many psalms that establish that this is already the case, that the temple isn't actually where God resides. It's just a picture of God's dwelling. It's just a picture of God's sanctuary. But we have affirmation in the New Testament that now God's spirit, it resides with us. There, the, there's something new. There is a new covenant. There's a new order that is getting 
that is taking place, that is coming together because Jesus is not of the Levitical high priesthood, but of the Melchizedekian order. And that's where the, the author of Hebrews, he continues on. He says, but Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. So he's no longer a high priest of the old shadow of things. He's no longer a high priest of the Levitical order. He's a high priest of the good things to come in the greater and more perfect dwelling place, not made with human hands, meaning not of this creation. So he's not a high priest of created things. He's a high priest of heavenly things. He's a high priest of something so far beyond our comprehension that all we have is a shadow of what that is. And you don't enter this dwelling place. You don't enter this tabernacle by the blood of goats and calves, but by his, Jesus's blood, by his own blood. So remember, one of the things that the author of Hebrews says is that the role of a priest is that they have gifts and sacrifices that they offer on behalf of the people. And he says, Jesus has to offer one of those things too. If he's going to be considered a, a high priest, he has to offer something. We can't call Jesus high priest if he doesn't offer anything. We, he can't be a mediator between us and God if he is not offering something on behalf of humanity. So what does he offer? He offers himself. And what this is called is penal, substitutionary, atonement. And this is extremely important for our understanding of salvation and is established here in the book of Hebrews. Penal substitutionary atonement. What that means is penal is the penalty due us. So the penalty due humanity. And what is that? Well, if you... Let me give an example of, of a car. If I was to go into a used car lot, and or not even a used car lot, if I was going to a junkyard, and destroy a window of a car in a junkyard, no one would bat an eye. There, there would be no penalty due me for doing for for destroying a car that's about to be destroyed. If I went into a used car lot and did that, I'd probably have to pay a little bit of fine to fix the car. If I went into a new car lot, that fine would be greater. If I did that to a Lamborghini or a Rolls Royce, I could be persecuted under the law. Not killed, but I could face jail time. The point is, the more valuable the object that you offense, the greater the penalty. If God is of infinite value, which he is, then the penalty is infinitely deserving of punishment, no matter what that penalty is. And so, if we are finite creatures as humanity, the penalty that it is due us, because of our offense against an infinite, a God of infinite value, is infinite punishment. Well, we can't, we can't take on that penalty. We're not capable of taking on that penalty in a way that would not destroy us. So Jesus does. He takes on the penalty due humanity for our transgression against the infinitely valuable of God. He substitutes himself in our place so that we are covered. So remember, if you recall back a few weeks ago, what we say, what we said is the Old Testament word for atonement is covering. Covering. And, and this is a word that goes all the way back to Adam and Eve when God covered them with clothes to hide their nakedness. Jesus substitutes his himself, takes the penalty of our sin upon himself in order that he can cover us with his righteousness. This is called double imputation. And this is a big theological phrase, but what it means is our sin is imputed onto Jesus and his, he takes the penalty. His righteousness is imputed onto us and we take the reward. So he bears the penalty in our place so that we can be called righteous in the eyes of God. That is what Jesus offers. He doesn't just bring a goat and put it on the altar. He doesn't take something from us and put it on the altar. He gives himself. He gives an, an offering, a sacrifice of infinite value to cover the transgression that was deserving of infinite penalty so that we can have his infinitely valuable righteousness. And this is a hard concept to grasp, but that's why Jesus is the perfect high priest. There's no high priest that can be greater because Jesus is God. 
and he's human, which means that he can offer himself. He becomes human so that he can offer himself, but he's still infinitely valuable because he is God. And therefore, he can have he can take on our sin and penalty and give us righteousness in its place in 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 place of the penalty that was due to us and therefore the author says he is the mediator of a new covenant which is a covenant that goes outside the confines of the shadow of things that once were with the tabernacle with the sacrificial system of the law of Moses with with all of the ritualistic practices that were once there He's a mediator of a new covenant. Now, that doesn't mean that the old covenant is pointless, that we just ignore all of that. Because the truth is, as Paul says, that I would not know my sin if it wasn't for the old covenant. I would not know the ways of God if it wasn't for the old covenant. But because the old covenant showed me my sin, it produces sin in me. This is Paul in the book of Romans, that the old covenant teaches us sin, but it means that our sin abounds to a point that we can't stop it on our own. We're not able to cover our sin because that sin just keeps coming. And the coverings that we put on there, it, things just keep shining through them. Only Jesus can fully cover our sin. And so the old covenant shows us our sin. The new covenant covers our sin. It's a covenant established through the high priesthood of Jesus, who not only is our high priest, but he's the offering. He's the sacrifice that he places on the altar, a sacrifice that is himself. And more than that, it is an effective offering. It's something that, you know, in the old in the old covenant, there were uh, priests that would they would minister and they would offer sacrifices time after time after time that can never take away sins because you'll just have to continue to offer them over and over again. But Jesus offers one sacrifice for sins forever. And then he sits down at the right hand of God. He sits down at the seat of authority. And the truth is, this new covenant was something that was alluded to by the prophets of old. It was something that, that um, the, the, the Israelites, they had longed for, they had hoped for, they, they wanted to be a part of this new covenant. They were searching and desiring this new covenant, but when it came, they didn't recognize it. And so the teacher of Hebrews, he's recognizing it and explaining this new covenant is now established in Jesus. This covenant that was promised through the prophet Jeremiah. And the, the teacher of Hebrews, he quotes Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, but I just want to read it. Jeremiah says, look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, this one won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, even though I'm their master. Instead, this covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my teaching within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will, know, and they will be my people no longer. Like will one teach his neighbor or brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least to the greatest among them, this is the Lord's declaration. For I will forgive their iniquity and never again remember their sin. What the author of Hebrews is saying is, this is the covenant we're in. And it's not because we finally climbed the ladder high enough to get out of the old covenant sky into the new covenant sky. But it's because Jesus came down, took on humanity, and was, has become our mediator between us and God. But he's also become the perfect covering that can take on our sins and clothe us with, with his righteousness. He is the new covenant, one sacrifice for all times, and now he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, waiting for all things to be made new so that the shadow of the tabernacle, it won't be a shadow anymore, will see the true images, the true picture that the tabernacle and the Old Testament law were alluding to. We'll see them for all of eternity because of what Jesus has established in our hearts through the new covenant. And so as as you're if you haven't read already, I encourage you to read through Hebrews 8, 1 through 1018. 
and even read into uh, Jer Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 to have a better understanding of, of what the author of Hebrews is alluding to here. And ask yourself this, how does knowing about the tabernacle and the fact that that it is a shadow of the eternity to come, how does that affect your faith? How does that affect your hope for the eternity? And what does it mean that we, as the new covenant believers, as the church, that we're the picture, that we are the, what will, will be eternally be in God's presence? How does that affect your faith, knowing that we are God's people under the new covenant system in Jesus' high priesthood in the order of Melchizedek? Some interesting thoughts to consider. There's a lot of theology to unpack. It's so meaningful when we dig into the Old Testament to understand it. So I hope you've enjoyed digging down. I hope you've enjoyed studying and that you'll continue to do so as we jump into the next section of, of Hebrews next week, looking at chapter 10, verses 19 through 39. We'll see you then for the next teaching video.